Okay, well, as I told you before, I'd like to read a text that we're going to use uh, maybe as a theme for what we're looking at, because if, if I may just uh, give you a um, preview of, of what we're going to be looking at when we actually get to arguing um, the argument that R.C. Sproul gave us to prove that the Bible is the Word of God. He said, we first prove that God exists, and then we look at the Scriptures not as the Word of God, but as um, reliable historic documents that where we have several eyewitness testimonies to what Jesus did. The miracles that He did proves that He is a prophet. He is sent from God and speaks His words. And Jesus says He's more than a prophet, that He is actually the Son of God. And He declares the, the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, to be the Word of God. Now, this is the argument that R.C. would, would use. And there are other ways of, of going about this, and we, we want to look at that. But, but <clears throat> along those lines, here is a passage, I've already read one, but here is another passage where Jesus declares Scripture to be the Word of God. Let me just read, um, I know we probably have, uh, okay, we do have a few more verses. I'd, I'd like to read through verse 38, but John 10, 35. Jesus is making an argument here based upon a psalm where um, the judges of Israel are called by the term Elohim, which is translated gods. And Jesus is making an argument here where he's saying if the Word of God called them gods and the Word of God can't be broken, then are you saying that I'm blaspheming because I say I am the Son of God? Now, I'm not going to try to explain that. That's one of the, you know, the difficult passages in Scripture. But the point that he's making here is Scripture cannot be broken. Let me read it. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the, word, and the Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, Though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Now, if you understood what Jesus just said there, he just made R.C. Sproul's whole argument, okay? Because they should believe Jesus. He is the Son of God. That's the point presuppositional makes. Presuppositionalism is that the Bible is the Word of God. You should listen to it, right? Everybody should listen. It's the right thing to do. But Jesus says... If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Okay, so he says, the miracles prove that I am speaking the words of God. If you don't believe me, believe the works that I do so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. So, Jesus declares the Old Testament to be the word of God that cannot be broken. And he declares himself to be the Son of God who speaks the truth uh, and they should believe it because of the works that, that he is doing. Now, what I'd like to do is, uh, I, again, I want to try to keep uh, at least for a couple of weeks, and this would be the second of the two, uh, those arguments that we looked at last week for God's existence. So I'm going to go through them all very briefly, just touching on them to get them back into the queue, okay? Um, and then we're going to move on from there. So, so far, okay, what we've looked at, Okay, are the arguments that prove that God is and show us something of what He is like. Now, the reason I want to do this is because there's another argument which simply says, well, the Bible says that God exists, so you should accept it. Okay, well, that's, that's one way of going about it, but this is the other way, and this is through reason. Okay, so we know that God must be eternal because something exists now. There's something now. If there's something now... There must always have been something because we cannot come from nothing, right? What we see could not have come from nothing. So something must be eternal. I'm using the pronoun he because we know we're leading up to God. He must be infinite because there can't be a place where there is nothing, okay? Something must exist everywhere. Remember, nothing is what the sleeping rocks dream of. It's not empty space. Empty space is something. By the way, 
Refer to last week, if, if not, these don't make sense, refer to last week where I explained these a little bit more thoroughly. He must be one because there can only be one infinite. We already said He's infinite because there can't be nothing. There can't be two beings because if there were, they would limit each other. They would both be finite and, you know, it's been said that it doesn't matter how many finites you add together, you will never come up with an infinite. There has to be just one infinite. And there has to be an infinite, again, because of the impossibility of there being nothing anywhere. He must be independent because if there's only one infinite being, there's nothing else that he could depend on. He's the only one who exists. He must be unchangeable because if there is nothing but him, there is nothing that would interact with him that would cause him to change. Now, the reason why I went through that was because we also looked at the fact that he can't be the material universe, because the material universe isn't eternal. It's temporal. It came into being at a certain time in history. It's not infinite. It's finite. If it were infinite, we couldn't move because we'd be locked in, in material, right? We'd be locked in substance. It's not one, but it's many. There's all different kinds of stuff, right? It's not independent, but it depends on something else for its existence. Otherwise, it would have always existed and be infinite and so forth. And it's, um, let's see, it, it's not unchangeable. Uh, as was it Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, said, everything is constantly changing. Nothing is static. It's all in a process of becoming. That's the way the material universe is. But we know that this being that's always existed must be unchangeable. Now, we know that this being who exists forever must be the one who created the material universe because he is the only one who could have created it. And that also means that he is very powerful. We saw that he must be personal, self-aware. He must be moral because we have these attributes. So whatever caused us must have those attributes as well. This is where that, that principle of cause and effect comes into, into play. The, the effect cannot be greater than the cause. So whatever we have, whatever caused us, must have at least what we have. But we know he has infinitely more. He must be intelligent. He must be purposeful because of, of what we see in the creation. And particularly in the DNA molecule, remember, which not only has a plan, but it has instructions on how to carry out that plan. It has machinery in place that's able to understand that information and put it to work. You know, to build that, that organism that shows that whatever is the cause of all these things has information. He's intelligent and he has, he has purpose. We know he must be morally good because he's given us a conscience that makes us feel good when we do what's good. It makes us feel bad or guilty when we do what's wrong. So if, if well, since this being is the one who gave us this faculty and Obviously, he favors what's good. He must also be benevolent because as we consider our lives, we know he's given us far more good things than bad, much more pleasure than pain. It's not that there isn't pain, okay? Not that there isn't want. Those things are there. But there is much more good than there is evil. But we also see that there is evil. There, is, there are these emblems of his anger, indications of his displeasure, that we see in sickness and disease and all the things about this world we don't like. Uh, thunderstorms maybe, uh, although some of those can be good. Conscience teaches us that those things are there because of our sins. We feel guilty. We see the signs of God's displeasure. And so we know that um, he must be angry. And we know also that he must be just because being good and being angry at the wrong things that we do, the bad things we do, we know that he must punish wrong. And Gerstner had another interesting argument that he must want us to repent and has provided a way for us to do that. Otherwise, he would have executed his judgment on us immediately. There wouldn't be any reason to keep us around. But he gives us time because he is leading us to repentance. He believes that natural revelation can even show us that. And one other thing we recognize is that all the characteristics that God has, He must have to an infinite degree because He is infinite. 
I mean, eternality refers to his infinity with regard to time, and of course, omnipresence, that's his infinity with regard to space. Omnipotence, his infinity with regard to power, but this also applies to his goodness, his holiness, his justice, his wisdom, and his knowledge. Everything that God has must be infinite because he's an infinite being. And that we learn just from general revelation. Now remember, this is what R.C. Sproul said was the first apologetic objective, demonstrating that God exists and that we really need to do that before we try to um, prove that the Bible is His Word. Now, again, just dealing with this one question, why do we need to do that? Why, why do we need to concern ourselves with all these difficult arguments when Paul tells us that God has so clearly revealed Himself in the creation that everybody sees Him, everybody understands that He is, everybody knows what He requires, everybody is already without excuse. So why bother with this, what seems like it would be a, a fool's errand of trying to learn all these difficult arguments? Well, it's because everyone apart from God's Spirit, Paul also says, suppresses that knowledge. They build arguments against that knowledge, against what God reveals about Himself so that they can live the way they want to live. By the way, that's something we need to guard ourselves against as, as Christians because we can do exactly the same thing. Anything an unbeliever can do, we can do as well, right? And if we find something in the Bible that we don't like, I don't want to do that. We can very easily find ourselves building arguments against it. Well, the unbeliever does that against God's revelation. And Everything he sees about God, the believer doesn't, but the believer is still liable, and we have to be aware of that. So anyway, because the unbeliever tries to cover over the knowledge of God, it's our job, according to Scripture, to tear down their defenses and their arguments by pointing to the evidence. Remember the verse that R.C. used as the basis for the whole series that lasted, I think, either 32 or 36 or so lectures is what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So, we need to be doing, again, what our Lord said, which is preach the gospel. And, of course, when Jesus went around preaching it, He was preaching primarily to Jews. The Jews already accepted the Bible. He didn't have to give arguments for that. All he had to do was point from the Scriptures the things that were true about him. When Paul went to the philosophers on Mars Hill, he didn't point to the Scriptures. He pointed to general revelation and showed God's existence from that and preached the gospel from there. So again, different approaches depending upon who our audience is. But be ready to make a defense according to the audience. But as R.C. said, there was a second task, okay? Having proven that God exists, we next need to prove the Bible is His Word. God has also given another revelation, a special written revelation to mankind. Uh, well, He actually has given it to the church, but uh, it's available now, that answers the questions the general revelation doesn't answer and really can answer. The question of how can I be free from this guilt that I feel? How can I escape the sense of impending judgment from the hand of God? Now, we're going to spend a little bit of time developing the argument, uh, again, beginning by what R.C. was um, teaching us, reviewing those things in his series, Defending Your Faith. And R.C. did touch on this, so I wanted to begin with this, and I found that as I got into this, it, it really took all the space that I was going to have to be able to deal with. So the, tonight, let's focus on why R.C. did not want to start with the Bible, okay? There are two groups of Christian apologists that start with the Bible, and he's going to, he argued against both of them, okay? Now, we might agree with the first position, but the second position, you know, is, is a little bit more difficult to tell. But we just need to weigh these things and, you know, think about how, how we should go about it. All right. 
So first of all, why don't we begin our argument by proving that the Bible is God's Word? Because if we could show that it is, and this is the reason why Christian apologists do this, if we could show the Bible is God's Word, then we have a document that has ultimate authority, right, and can answer all the questions with absolute authority, and nobody can really argue against it then we don't have to go through the trouble, as I've said, of trying to prove that God exists from all these philosophical arguments. All we really need to do is read the Bible and interpret it using the laws of, of uh, you know, genre, grammar, syntax to understand what the author means and also what it meant to the original audience. Well, as I've said, there are apologists who, who do start here who point to the many arguments that we're, we're going to look at, okay, a little bit later, not, to, not tonight, that prove that the Bible is God's Word. And those arguments would be fulfilled prophecy. Now, that's a very powerful argument. Miracles. Uh, R.C. is going to base, I think, most of his argument on those miracles, but we do have to be careful how we go about it, as he's already told us. The agreement of the writers... Let's not forget the Bible was written by, I think, 40-plus authors over a period of some 1,500 years. The authors came from all different walks of life. I mean, one was a shepherd, another was a king, you know, another was an apostle or a prophet. Um, and yet, they, and I should say they spoke on the most controversial, you know, subject in, in all of human history, religion, Right? And they all agreed perfectly, okay? That, that's, um, that's amazing, right? Um, the heavenliness of the matter or the fact that it has the ring of truth, R.C. was talking about, when he reads the Bible, he, he doesn't find himself judging the Bible, but rather the Bible judging him. And also, it's careful preservation throughout the centuries. So there are many ways that the Bible shows itself to be the Word of God. Okay, but R.C. said we shouldn't begin here, and he gave his reason for that. He said we first need to prove that there is a God before we know that there's the possibility of a word from God, okay? And why do you say that? He said that because the very things that these apologists point to to prove that the Bible is the word of God is also the very thing, or there are also the very same things the critics point to today to disprove the Bible. I mean, many critics today point to the miracles that are in the Bible uh, to argue that the Bible can't be true. And the reason why they do that is because they presuppose, they assume God doesn't exist. They assume the universe came into being out of nothing. I mean, that is the prevalent view today. And that everything came to be as it is, including the DNA molecule with all that information, purely out of an evolutionary process of mutation and natural selection. Mutation, remember, is just simply a random change in the DNA molecule, in the information, and then natural selection. If that change gives it a benefit, then natural selection will weed out the rest of them and that organism will, will continue to go. And that explains the thousands of volumes of of information, complex chemical reactions, and the, and the, uh, the, the well, the uh, information on how to carry those out and the mechanism, they believe it explains all of that, okay? If there's no God, there can't be miracles. They would argue that the church simply embellished the story about Jesus Christ to make Him appear to be the expected Messiah, if in fact He existed at all. You know, you talk to somebody about the miracles in the Bible, who happens to be a liberal, you know, a liberal, somebody who's in a liberal church, he would argue that. If there's no God, there can't be prophecy. So how do you explain prophecy? Well, they argue that editors later came in and, and added those fulfillments to make it look like these predictions came to pass, or the writers actually wrote after the fact, and that these documents are not really as old as they appear. As for the agreement of the writers, they thought, they, they believe it's just simple collusion. They conspired together to make sure that what they wrote agreed with what came before with the tradition and that they agreed with one another. And as to its effect on the readers, well, they were just very convicting and convincing teachers. So what R.C. was saying is that if 
you can't show that God exists, you're going to run up against people who assume He does not exist. And so, they're going to make these arguments. But if God exists, miracles are possible. Prophecy is possible. If there is one superintending mind that is directing all these authors, then they can write in perfect harmony, and they can give to us a perfect standard of what is right and what is wrong. So R.C. was saying, instead of using the Bible to prove God exists, we need to prove that God exists first so that there is a possibility of a word from God. There is a possibility of a Bible. Now, I think that's, I think that's good. I think that's, that's true. However, there's more, okay? There's another school of apologetics in the Reform camp, okay, <clears throat> that also believes that we should begin with the Bible, that we shouldn't try to give reasons either to prove God's existence or that the Bible is His Word, but rather presuppose that these things are true at the outset, okay? That position is called presuppositionalism, okay? Presuppositionalism. And the reason, the reasoning goes like this. Everyone has a presupposition, okay? Everybody has an assumption. Everybody has an ultimate starting point something that they refer to again and again as the touchstone of truth, either to prove or disprove anything. You know, I mean, the, the two things that are generally used for that are logic or some kind of a religious commitment. You know, for the Muslim, it would be the Quran. For the Mormon, it would be the Book of Mormon or maybe the writings of uh, Joseph Smith. Uh, JWs, you know, they have their watchtower organizations. So there, there are these certain basic commitments that people have. Now, for classical apologetics, and here's where we see the difference between these two positions, that presupposition, that starting point, that touchstone of truth is logic. I don't suppose you got that from the arguments that I've already told you they use for the existence of God, which you've heard R.C. arguing through those many weeks that he was arguing. Okay, R.C. Sproul and John Gerstner, his mentor, were both classical apologists. They both believed the starting point should be where it is that everyone actually begins, and that is with three basic foundational principles on which all knowledge is based. Okay, and those three, I'll, I'll, uh, who knows what those three are? I'm just kidding. The first one is the basic reliability of sense perception, okay, that we can gain true knowledge through our senses that is basically reliable, that is, we can trust what we see, what we hear, you know, what we, what we touch, what we smell, what we taste. We can, we can trust those things. They have, you know, they're basically reliable. Secondly, the law of causality, which is very key, okay, that every effect has a cause that comes before it, an antecedent cause that has the power to bring that particular effect about it. You know, that cause has to be able to explain the effect, okay? So the law of causality and the law of non-contradiction, and that might be the ones a little bit more difficult to explain. It goes like this. Something can't be A and non-A at the same time and in the same relationship. Perhaps the classic example is that I can't be a father and a son at the same time. Well, I, could, I can be at the same time. I can be the son of my father. I can be the father of my son, but not in the same relationship. See, that's why that part of it is, is added. And the reason that we have to um, accept this law of non-contradiction is because if we don't, then what we say can mean anything. It wouldn't have any definition. Uh, I could say chair, and by chair I could mean anything. I could mean car, I could mean plane, I could mean automobile. If I don't, when I say chair, exclude non-chairs from the category of chair. Okay, so these three principles, okay. Um, if we don't have that principle, we, we really couldn't make any sense. Now, this is the way that God has made us to think. This is, in fact, how we do think, how everybody thinks. Uh, Sproul and Gerstner would even argue that if you wanted to argue against these principles and say, I don't agree with those, you would have to assume that they're true. 
in order to mount an argument against them. <laughs> because how could you say anything unless you agreed with the law of non-contradiction? You know, you, you would have to assume that that is true. Now, they would also say, by the way, that presuppositionalists, and we're going to look at their position in just a little bit, they can't even hold their position without assuming the validity of these principles because they have to learn what the Bible teaches by using these principles. But then the presuppositionalists would come back and say, well, yes, but those principles, those three foundational principles are only true, and you only know they're true, not because everybody uses them, but because the Bible assumes that they're true. Well, I, I think they have a point there, don't they? <laughs> okay, so this is how we would argue if we want to show somebody that God exists and that the Bible is His Word. We would point to the evidence that, that, that we can see with our senses, okay? The basic reliability of sense perception. We talked about, you know, what, all, what a lot of these things actually are. Uh, Paul says that God has revealed Himself through the creation, so we should be able to see it. And then we should conclude from what we see that we know to be real that there must be a cause behind it that is great enough to bring it about. That I, I, I hope you see that these arguments that I just reviewed for you are mainly cause and effect arguments. Not all of them, uh, but especially when we say, well, God must be intelligent. He must be moral. He must be this and that because we are like that. We look at the effect. And we argue back to the cause, the, you know, the, the law, of, again, of, of cause and effect. So we would conclude that there is an eternal, infinite, simple, independent, unchangeable, intelligent, purposeful, wise, moral, just, benevolent, and personal being by reasoning from what we see with our senses, right? And how, what we must conclude because of the law of cause and effect. And, of course, <clears throat> the law of non-contradiction simply allows us to make these statements and make these conclusions. Uh, without it, again, we couldn't really say anything that makes any sense. Okay, so that is the classical position. That's what we've looked at. Now, what about presupposition? How do they differ you know, from this? Well, here, presuppositionalism believes that the ultimate starting point for us should not be those three principles of logic, but it should be that God exists and that the Bible is His Word. That should be where we start, okay? They presuppose what apologetics actually sets out to prove. Now, their argument is that because God exists and the Bible is His Word, because those things are true, it would be wrong for us, it would be immoral for us to start anywhere else than there. Since the Bible is His Word and it says that God exists, we should believe it because it is the Word of God. Now, let me ask you, do they have a point? I mean, isn't the Bible the Word of God? Yeah. Should we believe it? Shouldn't everyone believe it? Well, yeah, you know, they, they have a point. Yes, we should believe this. If we want to understand who God is, if we want to understand everything in the world, how it came about, how it all works together we really need to listen to what God says about these things. Because what happens when we don't have the Word of God and we're left only with general revelation? Well, even, even Gerstner and R.C. would point out that the history of science and philosophy shows that everybody ends up in the wrong place. They all go astray. So the question is, how do, how do presuppositional apologists? How do they, um, you know, if, if they presuppose what they set out to prove, how do they mount an argument? I mean, it seems like there can't be any argument. You've already, you're already assuming that the conclusion in, in your starting point, right? Well, they don't stop there. They, they do give evidence, okay? And this is the way they go about it. And this is not a bad thing. So they begin with this premise, God exists, the Bible is His Word, and then they step into their opponent's worldview, and they begin to point out how irrational and inconsistent that view actually is. I mean, let's step into the evolutionary worldview, okay? How absurd is it to believe that the universe came from nothing? You know, that there was a time when there was nothing, there was a fluctuation, nothingness, and then suddenly everything just sprung into existence. 
And then all of this matter that suddenly came out of nothing organized itself into what it is now through this evolutionary process, that all that information we were talking about on the DNA molecule came about through mutation and, and natural selection. That's absurd. How could anyone believe that, right? Well, by the way, stepping into the opponent's worldview and pointing out the inconsistencies, that's not something that just presuppositionalism does. Classical apologetics does the same thing. Sproul and Gerstner would do the same thing. But then they invite the, the opponent to step into their worldview. Now, now accept my assumptions and look at the world around and see that it all makes sense. It's all consistent. It's all coherent. Just understand it through what the Bible says. And while you're doing it, never give the impression that the outcome is uncertain or in any way up for grabs. The Bible is God's Word. Okay? Now, the question is, is that a valid way to argue? you know, for the truth of Christianity? Well, I would say yes, because all of that's true. And, you know, our opponent's view should be inconsistent. The, the biblical view should be consistent. But another question we could ask is this. Is it persuasive? Is it a persuasive argument? Now, that's questionable, okay? It depends. Depends on what, what you show them about your worldview, doesn't it? Now, Sproul and Gerstner would begin by, by arguing that it isn't persuasive. And the reason is because it's circular reasoning. Okay? Now, circular reasoning means that you're basically assuming what you're setting out to prove. You're begging the question. You know, uh, the Bible is the Word of God because the Bible says it's the Word of God. Or the Bible says it's the Word of God, therefore it is the Word of God. That, that's a circular argument. You're basing your argument on an authority that you haven't yet proven. And so how persuasive is that going to be? Well, as John Frame said, if you draw the circle that small, it's not going to be very persuasive. But you can make the circle bigger, right? So they would argue, but again, Sproul and Gerson would argue that's not a valid argument because it is circular. If you say that the Bible is the Word of God because it says it is, or that God exists because the Bible says He exists, that's simply begging the question. Well, presuppositionalists would say that you think I'm reasoning in a circle because I'm appealing to the Scripture as my ultimate authority? You are too, okay? When you keep appealing to those three principles, you are also reasoning in a circle, okay? So there's really no difference. That's, that's what presuppositionalism would say to the classical apologists. Now, the classical apologists would say, well, yes, there is a difference because we're starting where everybody has to start, where God made us to start. We have to start there, but then we have to argue to the Word of God. You're starting with the Word of God. Okay, so two different approaches. Well, Sproul and Gerstner would argue, hey, there's other books that claim to be God's Word, right? Such as the Book of Mormon, the Quran. I'm sure there are other holy writings and other religions. Should we accept them simply because they make the claim, is that enough? Well, the answer, of course, would be no. We're not going to accept it just because it says it is. We have to prove it is. But presuppositionalists would say, no, we shouldn't accept those other writings because their claims are false. You know, those are the writings of men. But the same isn't true with regard to the Bible. We should accept what it says because it is God's Word. Well, they have a point there. <laughs> and then Sproul and Gerstner would point out when Jesus' authority was questioned, and again, I'll read that passage I just read, that Jesus himself appealed to the evidence. He said, don't take my word for it. If you can't believe me, look at the works. And that's exactly what R.C. and Gerstner looked to as the miracles prove Jesus is who he said he is. That, that's the evidence, you see. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. They would say, well, look, Jesus didn't expect anybody just to take his word for it. He gave them evidence, right? So what evidence are you going to point to to prove that this is God's word? Well, about the only thing they could do is, is say that, um, well, like Calvin did. Remember when um, the Roman Catholic Church 
asked Calvin to um, prove that his doctrine, his teaching, was from God, he said, show us your miracles, remember? Because that proves that what you're saying is from God. We have miracles, you know, we've got these relics and we have these miracles that are occurring from the remains of the saints and, you know, there's these appearances of the Virgin Mary, all these things that prove that our doctrine is true. Where are your miracles? Calvin said, well, read the New Testament, read the Bible. God has already authenticated His truth in the Word. Those are the miracles that authenticate our doctrine because our doctrine is coming from God's Word, okay? Well, I suppose presuppositionalism would, would argue that as well. That, that Word, <clears throat> excuse me, has already been established. Jesus has already proven it, okay? So that is what we would look to. It's been established, and so now we should use it for that reason. And really, when you think about it, that's what Sproul and Gerstner are saying, okay? Now, finally, and again, I'm sorry if I'm taxing your brain, but it'll get a little bit easier after this, uh, after tonight. Finally, Sproul and Gerstner argue that if you're going to assume that the Bible is the Word of God because it says that it is the Word of God, then you really need to stop right there. If you're going to presuppose it, then you really can't argue for it because if you're arguing for it, you're not presupposing it, okay? They have a point, okay? There is a point there. If you offer evidence, they said, then you have become a classical apologist. So, in other words, Gerstner and Sproul see the presuppositional argument as this. The Bible is the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God, okay? That's as far as you should go. And they would say, that's not going to convince anyone. But that's not what the presuppositionalist does. By the way, I had a class with John Frame. He was a presuppositional apologist. And um, what he did was he said, well, yes, that's a valid circle. You know, the Bible's the Word of God because it says it's the Word of God. But we can make that circle bigger. And we can put miracles and we can put fulfilled prophecy and we can put all these other things in here. And we can say the Bible is the Word of God because all these things are true of the Bible. Again, trying to get wrap my mind around this and believing myself to be a classical apologist and being armed already because of some friends that told me I need to watch out for presuppositional apologetics, I wrote a paper for John Frame thinking I'm writing a classical apologetics paper for him. And when I was done, it was like, oh, this was a good presuppositional paper. And I'm thinking, I guess I don't understand the issue, right? Because I used evidence. Well, the point is, presuppositionalism uses evidence. Now, John Frame, who is presuppositional, believes that Sproul and Gerstner are presuppositionalists, just, just as um, Sproul and Gerstner believe that John Frame was a classical apologist. They both believe that they're in each other's camp because uh, John Frame believes this because when Sproul and Gerstner argue for the truth of Scripture, they are assuming the truth of what they're arguing, that the Bible is the Word of God, not that it isn't. Now, I'm going to say this, this one last point, and this is really the difference between the two positions, okay? They would respond to that by saying, that is not true, because we don't assume in our arguments that the Bible is the Word of God, even though we're arguing in that direction. We let the evidence lead to that conclusion we don't assume it at the outset in our argument. That's when the argument becomes circular. So here, here are the differences, okay? Presuppositionalism declares that the Bible is God's Word. And then they show that it is. They, they give the evidence that it is. While classical apologists such as Sproul and Gerstner, they show the Bible is the Word of God from the evidence. And we say... Okay, the only difference is where you start. Okay, that's the only difference between the two. Is that a significant difference? All I can tell you is this, that Sproul and Gerstner believed that, there, that that was all the difference in the world. They would say you offer this presuppositional argument to any philosopher, anybody who knows this stuff, they are going to immediately recognize it as a circular argument and they're going to say, I'm not even going to listen to you because the rules of logic 
basically rule you out of bounds. A circular argument cannot be valid. They would say their argument is not circular. It doesn't begin and end in the same place. But it starts where we all start with how we're made to reason, looking at the evidence, leading us to this conclusion. So they believe that their argument is linear. It's in a line. They argue in a line, not in a circle. And so their argument is valid. So what should we think about this? Well, there are good apologists on both sides of the aisle. Okay? We should really be asking these questions because I think both can be used. Which of these two approaches is more persuasive? You know, the, the circular argumentation where you start off with the Bible and, and then you, um, you end up at the Bible or starting where everybody else starts and moving in that direction, okay? Um, or, okay, another question is do you believe that you're morally bound to use one or the other? Do you think it's immoral? Such as the presuppositionalists would say about the classical apologists, you can't start where you start because you're starting outside of God's authority. You have to submit to his authority and he, he's declared his, his, you know, his, his uh, well, his authority, his, his will in his word. You need to start there under God's authority. You can't be autonomous. You can't be you know, self-governing, you can't make up your own mind kind of thing, but R.C. And, and Gerstner would say, everybody does. That's the way we come into the world. We come into the world rebels, and we have to be convinced to submit to, to the authority of God. We're not going to do it automatically. So you have to give reasons why somebody should submit. So which is more persuasive, and which is morally right to use? Again, I think it's perhaps up in the air. You know, Sproul and Gerstner were not really opposed to the presuppositional approach in itself. I mean, they would say, hey, that is fine evangelism, okay, but that is not apologetics. So you can use it for evangelism. I mean, that's what we do, don't we? I mean, that's what Spurgeon did, didn't he? He said, I can talk to you all day about the Bible and tell you about how powerful it is, just like I could talk about this lion locked in the cage, how dangerous, how powerful his teeth are, how he could tear you apart in, in a few moments. I could talk to you about it and try to convince you that, that he's powerful, or I could just open up the cage and let him out <laughs> and go at you, and you'd find out really quickly. Well, he said that's the same thing we should do with the Bible. Don't try to argue that it's powerful. Show its power by using it, but that is evangelism, okay? That is not what Gerstner and Sproul are referring to by apologetics. Apologetics is a reason defense of God's existence and the Bible, the reasons why everyone should submit to, to, to God and to the Bible. Now, I really, I think we can use either way as long as we give evidence, okay? I mean, I don't come to a person and say, I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, but let's just take a look at the evidence and see where it leads us. I don't do that. I would say, hey, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and you should too, and this is why. It sounds more like a presuppositional approach, but I would then use the arguments that Gerstner and Sproul would use, and John Frame would put them on his circle and say, this is where they are. They're, they, they're starting somewhere else on this circle, but they're still arguing back to the point where they started. Well, either way, like I say, as long as we give evidence, I'm, I'm fine. Now, next time, we're going to begin looking at, at that evidence and following R.C.'s uh, arguments. And I should say, next time we actually deal with this subject, because next week, um, because it's Presbytery, we'll, we'll likely have um, a, a video that um, is dealing with some aspect of, of this, this whole thing that we're looking at. Okay, so anyway... That's what we'll look at next time we, we deal with the subject. Well, let's take just a, a moment, shall we, in, in prayer. Let, let's, in, in light of what we're looking at, let's, um, let's just ask the Lord to help us kind of come to grips with what is the right approach, what is most honoring to Him. You know, how, how are we going to go about showing somebody else that the Bible is His Word, presupposing it or arguing for it?